Good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon, friends. It's a great pleasure for us to have Professor Tom Welton with us as a part of our one of the final lectures of the summer research training program, which started about two months before. And uh, Professor Welton, it's a pleasure to have you. He's the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And it was a delight to know that he's going to talk about chemistry for sustainable future. And uh, I came to know that he was the first, world's first professor appointed in the area of sustainable chemistry. Sustainable chemistry is very important for us in all times, especially in post COVID times. Its relevance cannot be, it can hardly be overstated. And I am also thankful to Dr. Rajesh Parishwad for bringing Royal Society of Chemistry to work with CSIR for conducting this uh, summer research training program. And my colleague, Professor Alok Dhawan, Dr. Mutkavi, and many others have joined with us to provide something for the people who were locked, who were locked in the COVID times and the summer research training program has several components and one of them is this eminent scientist lecture series and the other one is the lectures in specific areas and we also have a research project and uh, close to 4000 people have already submitted their final projects and we have a few videos like uh, which about 100 videos are already available which describe the instruments, for example, a video describing NMR with full details of uh, showing the instrument and how do you measure and things like that. And we also have the quiz programs, essay writing competition, and also electrician competition, where people will record what they have done and then upload, and this is now being evaluated. And all of this is possible due to high levels of commitment by several dozens of scientists and students at CSIR NIST and in other CSIR laboratories. And because of all their 
hard work in the last two months, we are able to bring up this program, which has close to a million views in our website. And the number of lectures, the footfall every day is about 5,000 people who will be watching this every single day. And this involves students at BSc level, master's level, as well as graduate level, those who are doing PhD and several mentors who are involved. And it's a real great honor for us to work with Royal Society of Chemistry, which played a very important role in bringing a great uh, value addition to the entire program, along with DBT India Alliance and a few other people who have come to support this. And with these few words, I really thank Professor Tom Welton for sparing his valuable time. My good friend, Dr. Rajesh Parishwad and Dr. Sharma from Royal Society for all their support and Professor Alok Dhawan. And I request Dr. Swapnali Hazarika to introduce Professor Welton. Swapnali, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, one and all. I am indeed honored to introduce such an eminent personality for today's session. Professor Tom Welton is the world's first professor of sustainable chemistry and is based at Imperial College, London. He began his academic career with a BSc at the University of Sussex, followed by a DPhil in the chemistry and spectroscopy of ionic liquids. After research positions at the University of Sussex and the University of Exeter, he joined the chemistry department at Imperial College of London in 1993 as a Leoch of London Tercentenary Fellow. In 2002, he was awarded a leadership in catalysis and undertook the role of Director of Undergraduate Studies in Chemistry. In 2004, he was promoted to professor in sustainable chemistry. He was head of the chemistry department from August 2007 to December 2014, during which time the department achieved an Athena Son Gold Award. He became dean of the faculty in January 2015 to 2019. Professor Welton uses solvents to improve chemical processes. He has worked with ionic liquids throughout his career in order to develop sustainable solvent technologies. The central academic aim of his research is to understand the role that the in immediate chemical environments which in which reacting species find themselves influence the reaction processes. He also aims to use this understanding to provide more effective chemical processes by matching of the reaction with its optimum solvent environment. Professor Elton is the author of over 140 papers, primarily on the structures and chemistry of ionic liquids and their solutes. He was honored for the 2007 RSC Christopher Ingle Lecturer the 2012 RSC Thomas Graham Lecturer and the 2011 DFG Paul Walden Lecturer. He is an honorary member of the Chemical Society of Ethiopia. In June 2017, he was awarded an OBE for his services to diversity in education. In 2020, he took up the position of President of the Royal Society of Chemistry. With this, I once again welcome you, sir, and I request you to kindly begin your presentation on chemistry for sustainable future. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your kind um, introduction, of course, for the invitation to come and speak to you all today. And the moment I start speaking, an aeroplane is flying over. <laughs> So I apologize if there's a bit of background noise for a moment or two. Anyway, today I'm going to um, speak to you about chemistry for a sustainable future. I'm not going to go into lots of detail of chemical project projects that I have done or other people have done in this area, but more 
you an overview of um, what do we mean by um, sustainability? So there we go. So these are the kind of things that we think of on a day-to-day -day basis as the products of the chemical industries. They are things that we rely on in order for us to be able to maintain our lifestyles. And so everything from pharmaceuticals to simple disposable things, um, we'll come back to that in a moment, such as, you know, biro pens, um, uh, clothing, cleaning materials, personal hygiene materials. These are all products of the chemical industries that we would not wish to do without. However, these can equally well be described as products of the chemicals industries. So pollution, whether accidental or deliberate. Um, and it's in many people's minds that this is what they think of when they think of chemistry rather than the things I had on the previous slide. But I want to focus for a moment on the top left hand corner picture. And this is a picture from England in the 1960s. So when I was a very young child and what you can see in this picture is foaming of the river air um, in England and that foaming was caused by detergents, non-biodegradable detergents. And for some time there'd been concern about this and I sort of just remember this as a child um, seeing pictures like this on the news and discussions of what can be done about it. And of course what needed to be done about it was the introduction of biodegradable detergents. And the problem was that the detergents that you can see causing this problem uh, were formed by branch chain alkyl, alkyl benzene sulfonate detergents, which do not biodegrade. And what was required was the introduction of linear alkyl benzene sulfonate detergents that do biodegrade. But of course, in order to do that, a technology Uh, Tom, we've lost you for a moment. Vishwajit, where was the problem? We have lost him yeah. or? Uh, some network issues. From our place or their place? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it will be at Tom's end because his screen is frozen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One minute, I will speak to him. Sure, sure, Rajesh. Hello. Yes. Yeah, Rajesh, uh, go ahead. I just had a quick call with Tom. I think he's reconnecting. 
Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm yeah. yeah. When did you lose? If you tell me when you lost me, I can go back to the presentation at that point. I I, I think sorry, Greg, let's go ahead. I think you were on your third slide. We we're talking about this. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to there. No, no, uh, the next, no, 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 on the uh, on the reverse, next one. On the next one, okay. Oh. Well, we were talking that about, one. yeah, correct. Okay, right, I'm terribly sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> the internet is a wonderful thing, but then it also um, has problems. So let me, again, briefly just come back to this. So uh, this is a picture from a river in England um, uh, in the 1960s when I was a young child. And what you can see is the um, foaming of the river, which is being caused by detergents, non-biodegradable detergents. And those, those detergents uh, were made from branch chain alkyl benzene sulfonates, which do not biodegrade. And so in the pictures on the slide, you can see those on the left hand side. What was needed were linear alkyl benzene sulfonate detergents, which do biodegrade. But of course, what was necessary first was a technology that enabled that to happen. And here is that technology. And so zeolites have been known for, you know, probably 100 years by um, this stage and as uh, natural minerals. And what had been discovered about zeolites was their capability to act as molecular sieves, that is to sort materials according to their size. Some would absorb and some would not. And particularly what had come about, um, particularly with the introduction of synthetic zeolites, which were aluminosilicate um, structures, was that five angstrom, so five angstrom is the size of the four, um, molecular sieves could selectively separate out linear C10 to C14 alkanes from other oil fractions. You get the alkanes as a linear as a linear fraction now, and so then you can either chlorinate them or uh, maybe dehydrogenate them to linear alkenes, which give you give you alkylation agents. So you can then do an arene alkylation, and that gives you the precursors which enable the non-biodegradable linear alkyl alkyl benzene sulfonate detergents. And the reason I give you this example is because um, it, it really says a lot about how we have to think about the impact of chemistry and chemical products on the environment. Of course, you know, nobody is thinking, oh, what mess can I make and let's make things as terrible as I possibly can. But what is required is a technology which is capable of delivering the thing which you need in order to lessen the impact on the environment. And here, the technology that enabled it was the newly gathering uh, technology of um, a solid zeolite, a solid acid catalysis, all of those things, which were still relatively new in the 1960s. So it's the coupling of an available technology with a desire, which is what we need to be able to achieve. But let me take a, a back and um, think about sustainability in general and particularly the concept of sustainable development and uh, there was a real landmark in 1987 um, when the UN World Commission on the Environment and Development reported, it's called the Brundtland Commission, sometimes the Brundtland 
report, but actually the title of it is Our Common Future. And it came up with a very simple uh, definition of what sustainable development was, and that is development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And then that's very helpful to us because it gives us a way of thinking about sustainable chemistry. And we can think of sustainable chemistry as the implementation of the concept of sustainability in the production and use of chemicals. And so that in, in many ways, I think is a, a reasonable summary um, for the you know, now massive field of, of green chemistry. How do we lessen the impact of uh, the chemical industries upon the environment while still providing the chemical products that we need. But then there's an important addition, which is the application of chemistry and chemical products to enable suspect sustainable de development to happen. So that's a very simple idea. However, I would say there, and I'm about to demonstrate that there's a small problem, and, and that is how do we know what the needs of our future generations are going to be? And I love this quote from Niels Bohr, the prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So here's a picture from St. Mark's Square in um, Vatican City in 2005. You can see it's at night time and you can see the crowd in um, the spotlit um, square. Now I'm going to show you a picture taken from almost exactly the same place in 2013 and spot the difference. Well, of course, it's obvious, isn't it? What you can see here is the lights of people's mobile phones and what appears to be an iPad directly in front of us. And then the key technology of these smartphone devices is really, if you think about it, it's the swiping screen. It's our ability to touch the screen and control the device. Now, if we think of um, all of the different components of our smartphone, what we can see is that there are many, many, many different elements that are involved in our smartphones um, from things like um, connectors, batteries, wiring. But what I want to focus on today is here. So indium tin oxide. So indium tin oxide is the material which allows our swipey screen to work because it is transparent and conducting. And so that is the central reason why we can have a touch screen. So now I want you to, sh to show you this particular periodic table, which looks a little bit unusual. Um, it was introduced by UCHEMS last year for the International Year of the Periodic Table. And what it's showing us is the relative abundance of different elements. And so this is a logarithmic plot. So twice the size is 10 times the amount. Otherwise, all we would see on this screen would be hydrogen and oxygen. And you can see what they have done for us is they've put a, a, a small image of a mobile phone in every element that is inside a mobile phone. And they've color coded it. And so from, uh, you know, Green meaning there's lots of it, plenty, plentiful supply through yellow and amber with increasing risk um, to, to, uh, to the supplies, up to red, which is a serious threat to the supply of that element in the next hundred years. And if we look very closely, there are indium and tin. So indium is one of those elements that is a serious threat for its use, which means that our swipe greens are at serious threat. And of course, the point I want to really make here is back in 2008, nobody cared about indium. It was a very niche element, maybe had some tiny little um, applications. It was not an element that we, pretty, that we really much cared about. But in the space of just a few years, it's gone from that to being an element that we all rely upon. And I doubt that any of us would be willing to throw away our, our mobile phones with our swipey screens and go back to the old phones that we had, which could just use the touch keyboard. 
So how do we predict the future? We can't predict the future. We don't know what the needs of future generations are, and this is a serious problem. However, the idea of sustainable, uh, sustainable development has developed during the intervening years, and now we tend to think about sustainable development as this. So here are the sustainable development goals, again, from the, the UN, and you can see there's a whole variety of, of them, starting from number one, no poverty, zero hunger, health and well-being, clean water. You can see that there are some of these which are very obviously technological um, problems, and so therefore you can see very easily that chemistry can contribute to the solution of those. But actually, even if you look at some of the others that aren't so obviously technological, good quality education, gender equality, reduced inequalities, uh, strong partnerships for the goals, these are also areas in which chemistry can contribute. And so now what I would say is we should think of sustainable development as the application of chemistry and chemical products to achieve the sustainable development goals which basically means that what we need to do is to bring the benefits of modern chemistry and chemical products to all communities, not just to those of us living like I do in central London in an extremely wealthy country. But in so doing, we need to use less stuff. And now I'm going to uh, use a definition um, generated by my good friend Isvan Horvath, and he likens the using of stuff and the making of waste to the rate of a reaction as opposed to the absolute amounts used. And so using less stuff means to consume nature's resources at a rate that is lower than that at which they can be naturally replenished. And so that means that we won't be using nature's resources up. We will be using them and being able to sustain their use into the future. But also, it's important, we need to make less waste. And so that means we need to produce waste at a rate which is less than that at which it can be naturally remediated. So that means that the, the world can cope with the amount of waste that we are making. If we can manage to achieve those two things at the same time as uh, the overall aim of uh, meeting the sustainable development goals, then we will have a truly sustainable chemistry. And so, you know, I talked about um, a problem that was um, a, a big problem during my childhood. I'm now going to talk about a problem which is really coming to public and policy attention much more now, and that's the problem of plastics. And plastics are everywhere. We use plastics in all elements of our lives and it has been found and they have been found plastic residues have been found all over the world in the most remarkable places and so here's a, one example so this um, is Henderson Island so Henderson Island is if you see on the map it's been marked out it's in the middle of the South Pacific probably pretty much as far away from any major conurbation that it is possible to get and yet if you see the pictures on the right hand side you can see the plastic waste that has accumulated on its beaches and uh, it, with its wildlife. And a recent study showed that, that 37.7 million items weighing 17.6 tonnes were found on the island's beaches, which equated to around 350 items per square metre. That is a huge amount of plastic in a place that is so far away from anywhere where we really live. And of course, the reason plastics are everywhere are plastics are everywhere. And, and again, if we look at the kind of um, uh, things that I showed you in that very first slide, and we see in all of these plastics, either plastics being the material thing itself or plastics being used in packaging for the thing that um, we are using. And if you look on the left hand side, what you can see here is that in fact, if you take away the um, fuel element and just think about the part of petrochemical production that goes to making chem chemicals and materials that we use, plastics represent 80% by mass of those materials. 
So that's why plastics are everywhere, is because they are everywhere. We use them in a huge number of different ways, which are vital to how we live our lives. So how can we start dealing with it? So I want to talk now about you know, things that you can do, you as an individual can do. And these, you know, I call them the five R's. And the first thing is, the first R is refuse. Just refuse to use it. And, you know, here's an example of one of the many, many, many things that we do that is hugely damaging to the environment and completely unnecessary. And so here I have a picture of the release of balloons in a balloon race. This is very often done. I don't know if it's um, done often in India. It's done often here in the UK as um, part of a celebration or part of a charity. And what we do then is, well, actually we take, usually these are helium filled balloons. So that's one precious resource inside the balloon that gets lost. And then of course, what we actually do is we litter the countryside and the seas with those with plastics of those balloons and it is totally unnecessary. There are many other ways to celebrate and we should just refuse to do it. The second is to reduce and here's where we start to see our behaviours as consumers and of course that means an interaction with the um, here home care products and reduction has been going on for some time and uh, you know maybe a decade ago we would have um, gone to the supermarkets and bought our here um, washing liquid in you know a three or five litre bottle and taken that home. And what the manufacturers have been doing is that they've been producing concentrated um, uh, products and not just um, liquid products, but also solid products. And that has an, a, a number of advantages. So there's the plastic advantage, which is a smaller bottle is made from less plastic. Uh, but there's also the energy advantage in that a huge amount of energy was being um, spent on moving around these large heavy bottles, which essentially were almost totally water. And so that water, the cost of shifting that water around the country and indeed internationally um, in energy was a huge contribution to global warming. But the manufacturer has also moved from the, beyond this. And so here I've got an example in the middle of using a refill um, pack rather than the uh, buying again the original bought in. And you can see here they are very kindly for us. They have shown that the refill pack has 75% less plastic than the original and you just buy the, the refill which generally tends to cost less. So that's a, an advantage to you as a, as a consumer and you top up the bottle when it is finished and you uh, reduce your use of plastic. The one on the on the uh, far left is another example. And again, still, even in these concentrated versions, still most of the stuff in the bottle is water. And so what this manufacturer has done is it's generated a refill pack where the refill is a much more concentrated solution of the product. And what you do is you take the original bottle, you fill it up from your own tap, and then you just add the refill to that. So again, further reducing the amount of water that is shipped around in the backs of trucks. The next thing you can do is to reuse. And we see this again over the last few years has become much more popular. Um, it's now commonplace as I travel around to see um, people carrying their reusable water bottle um, rather than going and buying a a fresh bottle of water every time they need it. Um, but you have to say that you don't have to necessarily go and buy expensive uh, uh, reusable bottles. There is nothing wrong with reusing the bottle that you bought your bottle of water in and just filling it up from the tap and then using it again. And of course, every time you use it again, you are reducing the amount of plastic demand you are making um, on the economy and the environment. The next is, of course, recycling. And recycling is now done on a much larger scale than it was. And here I have an example of some pet um, bottles. 
being recycled into, in this case, a, uh, a carrier bag, which would be one of the reusable carrier bags that I gave you an example of under reduce. And so we can recycle. And then finally, the fifth of the, of the five R's is this one, which is responsible disposal. And really, you know, the blight of litter is a, a huge contribution to the problems that we see with plastic wastes. You know, I live on an island um, in the UK, and it's very easy for litter to be disposed in our coastal towns and for that litter to just enter the sea. I mean, it happens all the time. And so responsible di disposal. And of course, things like recycling can only occur if we as individuals take the time and energy to be responsible in our disposal of the things that we use so that they can be recycled. Now, so how much of this has actually happened? And so here I have um, some graphs, uh, a graph and a pictogram. I think the pictogram is perhaps easier to, to read. And these numbers are in millions of metric tons. And this is looking at the amount of um, plastics that have ever been made. And at the time of this paper in 2017, primary production of plastics was somewhere around 8.3 billion metric tons of plastics had been made. Of those, about two and a half billion tons were still in use. And so that's for materials as I'm sitting here in my kitchen, I should say, and I have my mobile phone and that has durable plastic. My computer has durable plastic. My kitchen cupboards and work surfaces have durable plastic. So these are plastics that we want to have long lifetimes. And so they remain in use. But if we then look at the, the rest, what do we see? We see that actually very little, not yet even a billion tons of plastics have been recycled. So that's a tiny proportion of the amount of plastic that's ever been made. A similar proportion has been incinerated and uh, an energy recovery is it sometimes the, um, the best thing to do. Um, and the vast majority of the plastics that are not in use, which is almost um, uh, 5 billion tons out of that 8.3 billion tons has just been discarded. And that is why we have the problem of plastic waste. So recently at the RSC, um, we um, have re produced a report into how we can enable sustainable plastics use. And in that report, what we've done is we've recognized that as four research challenges. And so one of which is to really understand the impacts that different plastics have throughout their life cycle. So, you know, if one wants to weigh up, is it better in this application to use a biodegradable plastic? Or is it better in this application to use a recyclable plastic. And, you know, it's a fine balance sometimes making these decisions and the decisions may be different in different parts of the world because of course, as I said, recycling requires sophisticated recycling systems in order to be successful. And so to understand the challenges for the uses of different kinds of plastic is key to being able to make sensible um, uh, decisions. Now, of course, it will include making new sustainable plastics. And of course, there is at the moment, there's a quite a drive to look at how we can um, use materials, you know, perhaps materials that we've known for a very long time, like cellulose, in new ways um, to replace uh, non-biodegradable plastics with things which will be um, biodegradable, for instance, or the development of sugar-based plastics in order to create biodegradable plastics. And so we will need to develop new sustainable plastics. But also we need to make sure that we have 
really effective closed loop plastic recycling. So the plastics that we make that we can then recover and reuse either as plastics or there's a lot of interest in the moment at depolymerization technology. So can you take the plastic and depolymerize it back to the starting materials for the plastic and chemically recycle it rather than uh, mechanically recycle it, which is how most recycling is done at the moment. And of course, if we are to have this balance between having plastics, sometimes we want them to be very durable to last a long time. Now, other times we want them not to be durable and to degrade. We have to understand and hopefully be able to control the plastic degradation. And for instance, I was talking to uh, a company recently who are looking at additives that they can they can make to uh, polyethylene and polypropylene so that you can switch on a degradation uh, mechanism um, after use. So there's a whole world of research there that needs to be done and, and I hope that young people like you will take upon this challenge and set about solving it. So with that, I just want to say thank you um, to listening. I apologize for the problems that there have been with the internet and I will leave you for a moment with a picture of the sustainable development goals and then I will start unsharing my screen so that I can answer your questions. Right. Oh, so I can see, I can see a number of questions. How are we doing? Are you going to ask me the questions or am I just going to look down the list? No, sir, will you be asked the questions uh, for the question answer session. Uh, let me hand over the uh, agenda to Lisa and Monty, who are uh, our young students uh, who has compiled the questions and they will ask you the questions. Lisa and Monty, please. Thank you, sir. On behalf of our director and the entire SRDP team, please accept our sincere appreciation and gratitude for the outstanding and insightful lecture on the topic chemistry for a sustainable future. Your talk was particularly appropriate at this time when we are considering new initiatives for a sustainable environment. And sir, we really feel overwhelmed to hear you, sir. It is our great pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to interact with eminent personalities from all over the world via this SRTP platform. We are sure the participants are highly enlightened from your lecture with each passing day. We have become more and more confident interacting with all the participants as well as the speaker and being an interim between them. There are a lot of questions as well as there are a lot of appreciation comments. So with your permission, we would like to begin the question and answer session, sir. Should we? Yes, please do. Thank you so much, sir. So the first question is from Vedantham Sridevi. How does the modern chemistry used in sustainability resources? This is actually part of my own research. And um, of course, not just in terms of the kind of things that I was just talking about, but um, because of uh, global warming, but also because of uh, the sources for crude oil are getting more and more expensive to access and more difficult to access as we, you know, no longer have cheap and readily available um, supplies. What we can what we can see is um, a changeover to the use of biomass for making chemical products. You know, although you can, you know, we can imagine having every car with a battery and so we don't need to burn fuel in order to move the cars around, but material things need carbon, they need material. And, and so many people are interested in accessing biomass as uh, for sustainable resources. There are difficulties with this. And so, um, you know, successful biomass products on the whole at the moment do tend to be materials that compete with food production. And we have to be very concerned about that and make sure that um, we don't end up 
um, disadvantaging people who are already disadvantaged by taking out of food production things that should uh, should agricultural land that should be used to produce food. Um, but there's a, a, a whole load of research working on the uh, accessing of materials from lignocellulosic biomass, sometimes called second generation biomass, which is essentially the non food part of the plant. And so um, can be using agricultural waste, for instance. There are difficulties with that. And the biggest difficulty is the very first step in the process, which is deconstructing the biomass into its separate um, cellulose, lignin, and hem hemicellulose polymers in or for further processing. Once you've got them separated, then it, it, the, the subsequent steps, particularly for the cellulose, are much more straightforward. Um, but yeah, so in our in our work, we are dissolving trees and and, and that is um, like the likely future sources, sustainable sources of carbon based materials. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Sheikh Nasreen. Which protocol do you follow to discard unusable chemicals? Ah, so in my own laboratory. Um, so I think that you know this is, you know, again, it's really something that we can do to make a difference. And the the first thing to think about is the chemistry of the things that you're disposing of. So what we do is we separate out, just like you do when you're recycling, uh, we separate out um, the materials that we are um, disposing of into separate waste streams. And in fact, some of them are recycled. And so, for instance, so uh, in my catalysis work where we might use precious metals, in fact, what we do with those precious met metals is we collect them all together and then we send them back to Johnson Matthey. <laughs> And so they get, they do get recycled. Um, and in fact, sometimes John, Johnson Matthey will call it a, a, a loan <laughs> because um, they're not, uh, you, you don't have the, the metal permanently. So specialist things like that, we can, we can send back to the original manufacturers um, for reuse, I think it's probably better to say. And then of course we separate out um, other things. So for instance, um, you know, I'm sure, sure in many labs you separate the chlorinated and the non-chlorinated um, liquid waste, solvent waste. And the, the reason for that is because the chlorinated waste has to undergo a much higher temperature incineration in order to, um, to, to burn it than the, uh, the non-halogenated um, waste. And so therefore, the cost of, um, uh, of, of dealing with the chlorinated waste is much higher and a small amount of chlorinated waste contamination of the non-chlorinated waste moves it into being chlorinated waste and so that causes a problem. Of course the other thing that we do is we recycle solvents within the laboratory. I mean so you know you know very often we all have the same experience don't we? We, we have a litre of solvent and it might be less than a gram of solute and you know what you can do is actually you can use a, a simple rotary evaporator to recover solvents and so you don't you don't end up disposing of as many as you would otherwise dispose of so there are many different ways in which you can do it different different materials have uh, different things that you do um you know so solvent waste pounded waste but the important thing is to take care and that's the message that I would give. Take care in the use, in the disposal of unused or no longer wanted chemicals. And of course, the other thing um, which is absolutely important. So when I was young as a scientist, the typical mantra was, you know, buy a big jar because a big jar is cheaper than buying a small jar. And you would buy two and a half kilograms of something and you would use two and a half grams of it. And then that bottle would sit festering away somewhere um, until it became a disposal problem. Now, absolutely in my laboratory, we say buy the amount that you need and do not generate the waste. 
do not end up with unused chemicals sitting on the shelves, causing a problem for future students who come into the lab for the first time starting their PhD. They go to their bench and there are a whole load of bottles that smell bad that they need to dispose of. So actually, first and foremost, I was saying that in your own laboratory, only buy the amount that you need. Do not buy large amounts because it happens to be cheaper per gram if it's in a bigger bottle. But if you don't use it, if most of the most of what's in the bottle you end up not using and 10 years later it gets disposed of, that is not an economic saving either. So buy the amount that you need. Thank you, sir. for such an informational answer. So the next question is from Sheikh Nasri. Can you please explain natural remediation of waste product from chemicals? OK, so natural natural remediation is, is biodegradation. So natural remediation is that um, the materials can enter into the environment and be biodegraded by the processes that happen in soils and seas and waters. Uh, that's what I mean by natural remediation. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Hargun Kaur. Will sustainable development goals be affected by this pandemic? Will there be delay to achieve them or any other challenges? So, as I mentioned, I think probably not. I mean, of course, there's the short delay of, you know, the, the months um, that uh, we are have been experiencing and literally the, you know, the, you know, we're not doing as much research as um, we did before the pandemic, but that that moment will pass. But and then I think the reverse will happen. I think um, what the pandemic is going to help us understand is actually just how important these sustainable development goals and that we will redouble our efforts to achieve them as part of the post COVID world. Thank you, sir. The next question is, will we be able to retain the coral reefs that are destroyed by the plastic? Can you say that again? I missed it. Will we be able to retain what? The coral reefs. The coral reefs. And so co coral reefs are incredibly fragile um, ecosystems. They are under attack in all sorts of different ways. Um, including um, global warming and it is not clear that we have a means by which we can recover them and so no I would say my fear is that um, we may lose a lot of our coral reefs. Thank you sir there are lots of questions uh, so if you don't mind can we ask you one last question sir? Please do. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the last question is from R.T. Kansara. In a recent study, it was observed that polylactic acid, which is a component of bioplastic, has higher toxicity levels. So what is your opinion on this? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so yes, yeah, so uh, yeah. polylactic acid has been um, widely introduced as a biodegradable plastic. I think that it's it's more problematic than um, than that simple sentence suggests. Um, both the rate of biodegradation, um, the impact of its biodegradation. So one of the things when we talk about biodegradation, I'm done. the way in which it discuss is as a mass property. So what percentage mass of this material biodegrades in you know X time. Whereas what we need to move to is much more an idea of an understanding of chemistry and the interaction of the chemistry with the environment in that 
what does this material biodegrade to and what is the impact of that biodegradation product? And so it's not really an issue for poly, I mean, it is an issue for polylactic acid, not just an issue for polylactic acid, it's an issue for the way in which we approach biodegradation in the coming, we have to get away from the idea of it simply being about um, a, a percentage mass degradation, and we have to understand what it de degrades to. Thank you, sir, for so nicely and patiently answering all the queries. It was indeed our honor, sir, to listen to you. Sir, your years of research, your depth of understanding of the subject, and your ability to present it in such an interesting way has made this session really very intriguing, sir. We are glad to share that all our live platforms in YouTube, Facebook, and MS Team are filled with appreciation remarks for your lecture. Several participants have expressed their appreciation for the information you presented on sustainability. Sir, we look forward to listening more from you in the future. And now I would like to hand over the session to Lucky Seke, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lisa and Monty, for conducting this uh, question and answer session. Uh, Professor Tom, uh, it's a wonderful talk. So our students who were compiling the questions, they have also you know, compiled your uh, talk in few points and made the slides. So that is uh, now posted. So please have a look at it. And if, <coughs> if you would like to suggest something, then we can change it also. But uh, no, no, uh, no, it's fantastic. I think, I, I think it's lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. So, uh, Dr. Ojit uh, Sharma from RSC and uh, Rajesh Pariswar from RSC both are there. So, we would like to have comment from you also. Rajesh, Rajesh. Sir. Yeah. Ajit. Yeah. So, Ajit, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Shastri for hosting us. Uh, and it's indeed an honor to have Tom on the call and, you know, the sustainable uh, talk. This is a brilliant talk and is, is really inspiring. So I was looking at it both from uh, the RSC perspective as an employee uh, and a member of the chemistry community, as well as as a person who's uh, living in this world and, and looking at these problems with the eyes and trying to find a solution. Uh, trying to correlate on how do how can we i think there are a lot of uh, hidden signals within these uh, slides which we, one can take home and as chemists i think it's it, it becomes our uh, duty and our responsibility to uh, you know pay due diligence to these thoughts and suggestions shared by uh, tom and uh, you know implement them in real life so that's the message that I would want to give to all the uh, participants who are on the call today. And uh, I would really uh, like to extend my thanks to Tom, uh, Dr. Shastri and the entire team who's uh, managing this show in front of the camera and behind the camera. It was indeed a pleasure to be working with you. And I really, as the general manager for Royal Society of Chemistry, I am looking forward to work with you on many such projects in the future. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ojit uh, Sharma, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajesh, please, would you have uh, like to have your comment also? Yeah, no, I think uh, then I think Ajit has spoken at all on behalf of the RSC office in India, but I think I would just like to uh, extend my thanks to Tom uh, agreeing to participate in this lecture and give a fantastic one. I think uh, there are a lot of leads here for uh, in, apart from our society. I think there's a lot of discussions happening between India and UK as well for research collaborations in the use of plastics, and this is very well brought out. And I think this should be kind of uh, going to our the the counterparts at the British High Commission in terms of how we can explore this collaboration, collaborative efforts as well, based on the findings from the report. And uh, again, I'll, I'll, finally, I would like to say thanks to Dr. Shastri for again giving this 
wonderful platform for us to really interact. I think we had a great association over the last two months. We had a great uh, wonderful uh, this one talks and across all the sector um, across different streams we had talks on uh, how to develop your career we had talks on publishing how to publish papers we had some inspir uh, interesting talks on inspirational chemistry how do we do we had a wonderful talk from again helen who kind of talked about career and leadership and i think it it's very fitting to culminate with our uh, association with tom's talk and uh, on sustainability as well i think going forward I think uh, it's been a wonderful journey for us together and I think hope we like Ajit said we hope to continue as well next year if there is uh, online summer training program I think we would be lovely to have engage at this kind of a platform as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. So now it's my pleasant duty to offer formal vote of thanks. So on behalf of uh, director CSN is Dr. Jean Arahari Sastri and all the members of summer research training program and on my personal behalf we thank our today's eminent scientist speaker professor tom welton for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk on chemistry for a sustainable future professor tom through your talk you have enlightened us with wide spectrum of sustainability sustainable development goals sustainable chemistry and you know the use of plastic and most importantly the five R's refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle and responsible disposal. So I think this you know last one is also very much important that uh, disposing plastic in a proper way. Sir, words are not enough to express our gratitude for your wonderful thought provoking and you know truly a scientifically knowledgeable or lecture. So a big salute from the entire team of SRTP to you, Professor Tom. We thank uh, Dr. Ozit Sharma and Mr. Rajesh Parishwar from Royal Society of Chemistry India uh, for joining with us today and you know for connecting with uh, Royal Society of Chemistry with our SRTP uh, throughout uh, for last two months and you know helping in uh, different ways and uh, definitely it's a big thanks from the whole team of SRTP and on our uh, uh, from our director side. Uh, we also thank uh, Dr. Alok Dhawan and Dr. Bimut Kavi, even though today they are not able to present uh, due to some other meeting, but uh, their support and guidance are always with us and we are thankful to them. And the whole SRTP team is very much thankful to our honorable director, Jean or Harisastri for his tireless effort motivation, guidance and you know who has been leading the whole SRTP program for conceptualizing to this uh, stage of this program. We are thankful to our technical team, our young students and all other for their support and helpful. I must now mention that you know our uh, Dr. Zeno Horisasi is busy in an, another meeting. That's why he's not able to join in the last part. So again, uh, from his behalf, I thank you each and everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Professor Tom, and hope we'll listen from you in future also. And thank you. Uh, bye bye. And uh, session is here. Today. Thank you. Stay somewhere. Well. Namaste from India. Right. Namaste. <laughs>